Hey, it's Pastor Mike. Have you ever wondered what God is like or what Jesus was all about or how you get saved and what getting saved means anyway? Well, if you've ever felt embarrassed to ask, please don't. I really want to help you understand our big, amazing God. And a great place to start is a little book that I wrote called The Basics, God, You, Jesus, and Faith. And here's more good news. If you're always on the go and don't have time to read, you can now listen to The Basics as a podcast series. Just search for The Basics with Pastor Mike Novotny wherever you listen to your favorite podcasts. Are you kind to yourself? Because Dumbledore wasn't. Through most of Harry Potter's adventures in the book series and the movies, Albus Dumbledore is this great mentor who always knows just the right thing to say at just the right time until the end. The last time that Dumbledore talks to Harry, he confesses all the things that he messed up. And he says, you could not despise me as much as I despise myself. Now, of course, Harry speaks kindly to his mentor because that's what friends do. But Dumbledore had a problem with self-esteem. Psychologists have identified that exchange between Dumbledore and Harry as an example of the problems of self-esteem because esteem is a judgy word. Esteem is when you you evaluate something and then you make a judgment about it. And Dumbledore examined his past and he evaluated how well he had done and he, he esteemed himself low. He didn't, you know, look up to himself, but he looked down on what he had done. I'll tell you when esteem hits me, my self-esteem talk gets real bad if I'm laying in bed and I examine my day and I replay my awkward conversations in my head and I evaluate how it went and then I judge myself. I wonder if you've ever had that self-esteem talk in your head. I can't believe I just said that or I don't know if I'm doing the right thing here. Why are my projects always late? I don't know if I'm going in the right direction. And when you get to the esteem part and you have to make a judgment about yourself, you think no one could despise me as much as I despise myself. Okay, maybe you're not as dramatic as Dumbledore, but maybe it comes out like, am I disappointing my parents? Am I not living up to my siblings? I don't know if I'm on the right path. Here's what's crazy about about all those self-esteem talks. You would never talk to your friend that way. Can you imagine if you walked up to your cousin or you walked up to your roommate and you were like, hey, I've examined your life and I evaluated how you're doing and I just want you to know, no one despises you as much as I despise you. That would be crazy. You'd probably eat a knuckle sandwich and then, and then you'd have to realize that's not kind and that's not true. And that's why Jesus would never talk to you that way. Jesus met a crowd, and whenever Jesus meets a crowd of people, he knows them. He knows their faults, he knows their flaws, and he could tell you all their embarrassing stories. And yet he doesn't esteem them, low or high. He doesn't look down on them. He doesn't praise them beyond all the heavens. Instead, he had compassion on them. This is what it says in Matthew chapter 9. It says that when Jesus saw the crowds, he had compassion on them. Because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. Jesus has had compassion on you too. He knows your embarrassing moments better than you even know them yourself. And yet he doesn't look down on you or esteem you. His heart goes out to you. He has compassion on you for exactly one reason. Because you're part of this messy thing we call humanity. Now, Jesus doesn't want you to stay in your embarrassment. He doesn't want you to keep making the same mistakes over and over again. But he knows that simply judging you for it, it wouldn't help at all. So he has compassion on you. Now, don't take this the wrong way. But who are you to disagree with Jesus? Right? If the God of all heavens and the God who knows all things, if he has had compassion on you, well, then maybe you can have compassion on you too. We could spend a little less time worrying about self-esteem and a little more time 
talking to ourselves the way Harry talked to Dumbledore, the way you talk to a friend, the way that Jesus talks to you. Be kind to yourself. How many of your friends are perfect? Sometimes we use the word perfect to mean really good, but originally, of course, it meant zero flaws. How many of your friends have zero flaws? I don't know anybody who has that except Jesus, and yet I'm friends with a whole bunch of people not named Jesus. I'm friends with people flaws and all. And the Bible is full of stories about imperfect friends. There's stories like David and Jonathan. It's an amazing story. It's a true account. You can read all about it in 1 Samuel. I'll give you the short version. Uh, David is going to be the king of ancient Israel, but he's friends with the son of a different king, King Saul. Uh, king Saul wants to kill young David. That doesn't stop Jonathan and David from being the best of friends. They share hobbies. They share stories and secrets. They care about each other. And they support each other, even though they had major flaws. Jesus' disciples were famous for messing up, putting their foot in their mouth, and saying all sorts of things that were inappropriate. And yet, they lived together. They laughed together. They learned together from Jesus. They supported one another. Those people in the Bible knew what you know about friendship. A person doesn't have to be perfect for you to be friends with them. So I'm going to tell you about the most surprising story of friendship that I've read in the Bible. There was a, one of the friends who had a bad day. People were being unkind to him. And so he was reviewing all the ways that he's not perfect. He was all in his own head. It was bad. And then his friend came along and did what friends always do. He said, hey, why don't you tell me what's on your mind? Tell me what's got you down. And then he listened. And when he was done listening, he pointed his dear friend toward the God who loved him. The Bible doesn't even tell us the name of those friends. It calls one of them, my soul. And it calls the other one, me. He befriended himself. Psalm 42 verse 5 says, Why, my soul, are you downcast? Why so disturbed within me? Put your hope in God, for I will yet praise him. That's how you'd talk to a friend, isn't it? Is that how you talk to yourself? I have trouble with that. I can forgive the flaws in my friends, and I work really hard not to hold it against them. And yet, I have a hard time forgiving myself for my imperfections. Isn't it kind of crazy that we call ourselves stupid or ugly or lazy when we would never say that to a dear friend? Of course, you know that you're not perfect and I know that I'm not perfect and yet all of our other friends are also imperfect. When I'm having a really hard time uh, befriending myself, sometimes my negative self-talk, my unkindness will leak out of my brain and come out of my mouth and my family will hear it. And that's when my wife does one of the kindest things she ever does for me. She says, hey, you be nice to my husband. She's right. We need to be kind to ourselves. If ever you find yourself running down a list of your imperfections in some unhealthy way, just remember what Jesus would say. Hey, be kind to my friend. Be kind to yourself. Do you remember the story of Job from the Bible? Job believed in God and he had this big happy family with lots of money and lots of animals, lots of land. Then he lost it all. In one day, natural disasters and war took all that he loved. When Job explained why he still believed in God after all that tragedy, he said, this brilliant insight from Job chapter 2, he says, Shall we accept good from God and not trouble? I love that insight because it shows me what was in his heart. It shows that he knows 
the things he likes are part of God's plan and the things he doesn't like can also be part of God's plan. It's all a gift from his father who loves him. I love that those words are recorded in the Bible because they have helped millions of people deal with hard times. But sometimes I have trouble dealing with good times. You ever had this? Have you ever had it where you, you get a, a new job and somebody tries to congratulate you for it, but you push back on it a little bit? I sometimes push back on experiencing the joy that God is giving me saying, oh, it's, it's nothing. Or, or somebody compliments your outfit. They say, you look great today. You say, classic line, right? Oh, this old thing. Sometimes when I have a reason to celebrate, I push back on experiencing the joy that God is giving me. But what's wild is you would never talk to a friend like that. But how awkward would that be? Your friend is showing you their new apartment. They're so excited. Hey, look at this beautiful place. And you say, whatever, it's not that cool. It would be so awkward. It would be funny if it weren't so cringy. You'd never say that to a friend because it's not nice. And it's not nice when you say it to yourself either. That's why God says exactly the opposite. In James chapter 1, verse 17, he says, Every good and perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of the heavenly lights. Every good and perfect gift comes from God. God did not just give you the bare minimum. No, he, he gave his one and only son to take away the sins of the world with his death and resurrection. But God didn't stop there. He provides food for all people, believers and unbelievers. He gives all his children specialized talents so they can contribute to our world. God blesses people. He blesses us with apartments and with pets and with concert tickets and with good times. And every good and perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of our heavenly lights. When God gives you a reason to celebrate, he's celebrating. And you can too. I recently had a chance to relearn that with a, a dear friend of mine. He had had like a long string of relationships that ended badly, a lot of broken hearts. And one day I met him and he had a twinkle in his eye. He had met a girl and I thought the appropriate reaction was a high five, right? Like this is awesome, but he was playing it cool and he made it seem like it was nothing. He said, oh, it probably won't even last. So I whipped out a thought. I stole a thought from the book of Job. I said, you mean to tell me that you put your heart on the line over and over again and you risk heartbreak and now this beautiful thing happens and you're not even going to celebrate it? So I stole from Job, should we accept trouble from God and not good? <laughs> when your Father in Heaven gives you something to rejoice about, something to celebrate, He's being kind to you. You can be kind to you too. When my friend's head hit the basketball court, it made a loud bang. We all stopped playing and watched him slowly get to his feet. He asked me to take a look at it, and so I gently, slowly brushed the hair away. Oof, I said, yeah, we're gonna need to see a doctor. A few staples in the back of his head, and he was on the road to recovery. Later on, we were reminiscing about that day and not just about the cut, but we were talking about some mistakes he'd made, some honestly bad choices in his relationships. And the way that we talked about it reminded me of how we had dealt with his head. It was gentle and patient and we were aiming at healing. It made me wonder, why am I often not so gentle with myself? I've never split my head open playing basketball, but I have made more than my fair share of mistakes and often really big ones that cost me. The Bible calls that sin. I'm guilty of it. We all are. And so often we don't deal with our sin well. Have you ever noticed this? That 
sometimes we we deal with sin in a way that doesn't address the problem at all. Sometimes I try to replay the sin over and over in, in my mind, reliving my mistake as some weird form of punishing myself. Other times we like to just try to rewrite what actually happened. If only I wasn't in that position. If only uh, I never opened my mouth and said such a stupid thing. But sometimes we pretend like it didn't happen at all. Sometimes we try to sweep our sins under the rug as though there was nothing to worry about. Can you imagine if that's what I did with my friend? You would never do that with a friend. Imagine if my friend knocked his head on the floor and he's got a cut. And if I just replayed it over and over again for him, I just described for him like five times how he fell down. It wouldn't help at all. Or if I tried to rewrite it and say, well, maybe you shouldn't have just been standing at that point on the court. Worst of all would be if I just ignored it. I took a look, found his wound and said, you've got nothing to worry about. That's not the way you help a friend deal with something, whether it's their physical injury or something that they're messed up. Instead, you gently and patiently uncover the wound so that you can find healing. That's how God deals with our sin. Psalm 103 says, As a father has compassion on his children, so the Lord has compassion on those who fear him. Jesus knows that we are sinful, but he didn't just make us relive it over and over again. And he doesn't pretend like it's no big deal. Instead, he came to this earth and paid for our sins with his death on the cross. He guaranteed our forgiveness with his glorious resurrection from the grave on Easter. And now, just like any good father helps the little kid to learn about sin, to learn how to make good decisions with all that same gentleness and patience and persistence, our Father in heaven gently helps us deal with our sin. Your memory is probably haunted by sins that you committed long ago or not so long ago. I know my mind certainly is. Instead of beating yourself up about those things, instead of pretending like they didn't happen or they don't matter, Let's do what God does. Let's deal gently and patiently with ourselves, uncovering the wound not to maximize our pain, but so that we can better appreciate the forgiveness of our gracious Father in heaven. When God deals with your sin, he does it kindly, so you can too. In this whole series of videos, I've been giving you some biblical reasons why you can talk to yourself nicely, why you can consider yourself the way you consider your friends. And one of my favorite examples of that positive self-talk, it comes from an old movie. A man has been having a rough time and lost his purpose in life. And so he finds a mirror and he says to his reflection over and over again, these affirmations until he's shouting at the mirror. He's shouting, you're proud and you're powerful and you don't let anybody tell you otherwise. Have you ever done mirror affirmations like that? I've tried it occasionally. You walk to the mirror in the bathroom in the morning and say, you're beautiful. But it just doesn't quite seem right when I'm saying you're beautiful and my reflection has like bedhead coming out this way and half my face forgot to wake up that day. Or if I say, you're great just the way you are, and my mind goes to all the things that aren't going great, and so many of them are my fault, I suppose I could say, you're a mess, and uh, your life is falling apart, but keep trying, but that just doesn't quite hit the same. Do you ever feel like when you say nice things to yourself, they're not accurate? I suppose it depends on what the nice things are and who's saying them. What does God say? In 2 Corinthians chapter 5, it says, Christ died for all, that those who live should no longer live for themselves, but for him who died for them and who was raised again. When Jesus died on the cross and when he rose victoriously from the grave, he did it for all people. 
because God loves all people. That's why he did it for us. And it changes the way that we think about ourselves. Of course, God doesn't want people he loves to stay in their sin, to stay in the mistakes and the failures that they make, just like you don't want the people you love to keep their toxic behavior going. But it's not that God won't love us if we don't stop sinning, is that he knows that's not our best life. That's not who we truly are. Who we truly are is people who live for God, people loved by God. All people are loved by God. And so the passage says, from now on, we regard no one from a worldly point of view. And it changes the way we talk about everybody and everybody includes you yourself. To your worldly point of view, it may seem like you have bedhead and you are only messing up, but you have to know that God sees you in an entirely different way. The passage continues by saying, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come, the old has gone, the new is here. You are a brand new person in Christ. You who are loved by Jesus, not because of all the great things you have done, but because of the wonderful things he has done for you. So when you stand in front of your mirror in the morning, if God were standing behind you, just know what he'd be seeing. He sees someone beautiful, someone powerful, someone who has a clean conscience and a perfect record, someone who has a fresh start, not just every morning, but every moment of every day. If that doesn't seem quite accurate to you, consider who's more likely to be right, you or God. I wonder how our lives would change if we were a little more kind to ourselves, if we took more seriously what God says about us. I wonder what life would be like if we talked as kindly as God talks. It just might look like a whole new creation.